The more important it is for pieces to fit together precisely or to fit a specific space in an overall dimension when the project is completed, the more important it is to do test pieces. Doing test pieces also makes sure that you understand the process, your tooling is correct, chisel sizes, punch sizes, things like that. So any large project, it pays to do test pieces. Now admittedly, I really like to just kind of wing it and go for it, but most of my work doesn't need to fit something precisely, and it's okay if it's a little bit more organic. The first thing I want to do is cut some bar that will cover the distance that I need to test. One of the main things we're really doing test pieces for is the hole space between the verticals. When you punch the holes, is that going to draw the bar in, or is it going to make the bar stretch? Okay, probably not going to make the bar stretch, but it may be a negligible difference on how much it might draw that bar in when you punch, slit, drift. Got to do a little bit of upsetting to make that work. I'm going to make notes right on my full-size drawing so I know where my hole spacings are for the test piece. Then I'll make the adjustments. The holes in this bar are not pierced and passed through, so this actually just gets a regular punched hole instead of a slit and drift hole. These holes will be slit and drift. I'm center punching all the points where I need a punched hole. On the finished piece, I'm going to want all these square cornered bars to at least have the corners knocked off a little bit. Just something that is not the finish that comes right from the steel mill. I'm not going to just gratuitously beat it up, but I do want to knock the corners down. So I'm going to do that before I go any further. It doesn't make much of a difference in the length of a bar, but just in case, you should do it for the test pieces. You want to make sure it's straight when you're all done with this. That one started off a little crooked, so I'm moving it over. Regardless of whether you're punching at the anvil or under a treadle hammer or a press, make sure you keep your punch cool and some punch lube or coal dust in the hole can help a whole lot to keep the punch from getting stuck. Now because this is a relatively thick bar, I can shear it out from the back without having to put it over a bolster or pritchel hole. So I'm going to drift these to a half inch, and I'm using a drift pin I usually use for hinges. I think I could stand a slightly shorter one, so that may be another tool I make before tackling the finished piece. Now remember, this drift is going to get hot, so you either need to cool it or pick it up with a pair of tongs. For the vertical that intersects the square bar on the diamond, we are going to punch a square hole in the diamond.
Now the whole idea behind this series of videos is to encourage you to challenge yourself as a blacksmith. But if you want to challenge yourself in other creative aspects, you might want to check out today's sponsor, and that's Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of classes to choose from. They have classes in just about anything you can think of, even a few on blacksmithing, but for the most part it's things like graphic design, drawing, video editing, photo editing, all sorts of creative interests for the world we live in. Heck, you can even take classes in how to set up, manage, and succeed on YouTube if you're interested in starting your own YouTube channel. For me, I'm still in the middle of a photo editing class, one of the more ambitious classes I've ever taken through Skillshare, to try and get better at just photo editing, whether that's for product photos, for thumbnails here on YouTube, family photos, whatever it may be, the software is so powerful that you really need somebody to help guide you through it and teach you what you need to know. And it's a great opportunity on Skillshare to have that kind of information available. The first 1,000 people to use the link in my video description or use my coupon code will get a one month free trial of Skillshare. Now, let's get back to work. So if we compare our bar to the original layout here, I can notice that my hole centers are a little long here. So this piece is just a little longer than it needs to be. But over here, it's a little bit shorter than it needs to be. So that means that I'm, my average is pretty much right. Just laying this out, punching the holes, it stretched a little bit in one instance and did not stretch in the other, which may have been an actual layout issue. I'll be able to upset this a little bit through here, draw it out a little bit on this side, and it should be just fine. Now the sidebar, I intentionally did not leave room for the tenon. I was mostly checking where the shoulder would go. And again, it lines up almost perfectly, a little upsetting or a little bit of drawing out to make fine adjustments at the very end. Won't be too hard on that. So the next task is to do this center bar. There's gonna be two of these. I only need to test one. And this will get the slit drift for the square bar on the diamond. So that's where we're going to need the chisel that we just made last week and the square drift we made last week. You want to proceed slowly, make sure you're straight and centered end to end. Do some from one side, then turn it over and work from the other side. Another reason to do test pieces is to see problems with what you're doing. I'm pinching out a little bit of the material here on the sides because the swedge is designed to punch through and the slitting chisel is moving too much material side to side. So this is going to be a problem in the long run. This, this swedge may not be the thing I want to use. Even though it is actually the tool that inspired this whole idea, I may not use it on the final project. 
may have to make another tool or I may find something else that I have that gets the job done. But that's just one of the many reasons why taking the time to do test pieces is so darn important. Your finished product will almost always look better if you take the time to figure this stuff out on something that doesn't matter so much. So I'm going to switch to a much wider swedge. Now I'm just starting to break through on this and I don't want to cut into my swedge, so I'm going to remove the swedge and go to a soft plate. This is opening up enough that I don't feel like I need any kind of intermediate opening tool. I'll go ahead and upset it some and that's going to open it a little bit further. Once it's open I want to start establishing a square hole by eye and then I'll use the drift to establish the final size. It's getting pretty close. I think it's time to go to the drift. We'll start our tenon by butchering the shoulder in. The guillotine tool is probably the ideal tool for this, but there are other options if you don't have one. With the shoulder established, I'll draw out the tenon, square, octagon, then round. This can also be done with a guillotine tool using some tenoning dies. Another approach to doing this would be to use a spring die into the power hammer. Then we use a monkey tool of the matching size to make sure that shoulder is nice and square. That's all I want to do to that bar till we try it in and see what it looks like. Next let's put the tenon on the three quarter inch square bar. Now this one's a little bit simpler because it is a square tenon and won't need to be rounded up.
It's still just a little bit fat. You don't want to use the monkey tool to force this to size. This is just for cleaning up the shoulder. You can see in there that's not too long, so get that hot and then we'll shoulder that up. And that is really all a monkey tool is for. It does leave a little upset, and that's something I want. I like that look. If you didn't want it, you could work back and forth and clean that off. If you wanted more of an upset, you could upset it before doing the tenon just to have more mass there. I need to let those pieces cool, do that little bit of stretching and upsetting and things like that to some of those other pieces, all that fine tuning, so I could have another hour in this before I'm ready to assemble this. In addition to that, I'm not real happy with the way that square slit drift came out. I think that got a little bit thin have some ideas on how I'm going to fix that. That'll all be shown in next week's video when we actually start forging all of the parts for this, and hopefully that'll be the final go. But I think I'm going to do a few more test pieces before I assemble the little test corner that I'm working on, and there's a good reason to go so far as to actually assemble it and make sure that corner at least matches your layout and is going to do what you want. I think this ended up a little bit on the thin side. It's thin both in the thickness here, and this just looks like it's not half on each side of the hole. It looks like it's all been thinned out a little bit too much by working it. The solution to that is to upset it before you start slitting it and drifting it. So I'm gonna do another test piece like that, make sure that works. I may even have to make more tooling so that when I say, we're going to see all this in next Sunday's video. I might be a little over ambitious with that statement. If I have to make more tooling, like maybe uh, another bottom die to work this in instead of the one I thought I was going to use. Actually kind of disappointed that the thing that inspired this project isn't actually the thing I need, but sometimes that's the way it goes. You take one idea, you build on it, you come up with another idea, and who knows where it's going to take you in the long run. So remember, get out to your shop, challenge yourself, be safe, wear your safety glasses. We'll see you for the next video.